If we start about 10 to, if you go to about 10 to 5 to, so an hour is just over. So people can get to lunch for 12. So, we'll get, so can you say that again? We'll start so we were due to So we were due to start at 10 to 5. Okay. okay. Like so we're cool. So if you keep an eye on, during the Q&A, if you keep an eye on the clock, and then we get to about 10 to 2. Um, That'll be it. Okay, so just an hour. That's just an hour. So yeah. 10 to 1. I don't want to go for lunch because I'm going to go for chocolate. Right? Right. So You're 10 to sure 5 to the latest, 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 latest. But ideally, I'd finish in 10 to 2. Sounds great. I don't think he tends to go long with papers, so yeah. I should be quite comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, Hello. Welcome back, everyone. Good to have you back for this session, and welcome to those of you who are tuning in online. My name is Adam Nieder, and it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Johnson. 
Before I do that, I would like to uh, remind you, some of you already uh, have seen it, but we have some booksellers across the hall who have some wonderful stalls. So feel free to move over there and take a look at the books and um, chat with folks over there. So our speaker today is someone that um, I'm guessing all of you in the room uh, already know. He probably needs no introduction. He is um, part of the fabric of BART studies in this country and around the world, Keith Johnson. He is professor of theology at Wheaton College, where he also serves as the director of theological integration at the Center of Faith and Innovation. He has authored and edited several volumes related to BART, including The Wiley Blackwell Companion to Karl BART, co-edited with George Hunsinger. Also, The Essential Karl BART, a reader and commentary, and Karl BART and the Analogia Entis. Keith is currently the president of the Karl BART Society of North America, and in my judgment, one of the most impressive and trustworthy theologians working today. It is our great pleasure to have him here with us, and I have spoken throughout the weekend to many folks who are really looking forward to this paper. So Keith, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Well, I, I somewhat appreciate that since you set the bar so high. I'm thinking, don't screw this up. Don't screw this up. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Paul and Kate for the invitation to be here and Yana, who is helping me with slides. Um, I thought since it's Tuesday, um, it's been a long week that it, in any event, if the paper gets slow, you can see some pictures of Bart. So along <laughs> the way, um, we're going to be looking at some pictures. Um, my paper has, um, don't panic, my paper has seven parts but it, um, do not be alarmed because they move very quickly and the outline will show up on the screen as we go. So you can see that we're making progress. Um, and let's jump right in, part one. In a slate of recent studies, sociologists and historians have shown that Christian nationalism is among the forces most responsible for the present polarization in American life. In the American context, Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates for a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. It appeals to many Americans because it offers a deep story, reflecting the traditions, symbols, narratives, and values central to their cultural and religious identity. This deep story goes something like this. America is a Christian nation because it was founded by men who shaped the nation's documents in light of Christian principles. The most important of these principles is freedom, understood in the libertarian sense of being free from regulation. The founders recognize that every person has inalienable God-given rights, and any restriction on these rights, especially by the government, runs contrary to God's order for creation. Because the United States has upheld this order, God has blessed it with unparalleled power and prosperity and given it a unique role in history. But now the American way of life is threatened by people inside and outside American borders who seek to undermine American values. So faithful Americans need to take their country back by electing leaders who will recover America's Christian heritage, restore law and order, and protect America from outside threats. And if these political means fail, then Americans might have to take up arms to defend their freedom and their country from those seeking to destroy it. Now, millions of Americans believe some version of this story. It reflects the history they were taught in schools and the theology they have received in their churches. This story has been, re been reinforced by a constellation of books, movies, politicians, church leaders, and media figures. It gives them a framework for understanding their citizenship and provides moral stability for them, giving them a sense of heroes and villains, right and wrong, justice and injustice. It also helps them make sense of the Bible because it allows them to apply often obscure biblical stories directly to their daily lives at work, at home, and in society. It is the default political theology 
that many of my students have when they enter my classroom. And the same is probably true in many of your classrooms and churches. The problem is that this story is neither true nor Christian. Historically, the history of America envisioned within Christian nationalism is mythological. It depends upon a misleading account of American history that overlooks well-established facts like the diverse religious views of the founders, the variety of philosophical influences behind the Declaration and the Constitution, the reality that much of America's prosperity and power over the centuries is the result of stolen land and slave labor, the ongoing dehumanization of minorities, and the inconsistent application of human rights. Theologically, Christian nationalism in America can be labeled Christian only because its adherents identify it as Christian. But it is not Christian in any recognizably biblical or traditionally orthodox sense. It is a disfigured, hybrid version of Christianity, a theological distortion grounded upon an incoherent form of supersessionism and the co-opting of Christian language and imagery to justify the pursuit of political and economic power. We in this room pursue our vocations in a world shaped by this false story. How do we counteract it? What difference can we make through our teaching and writing and preaching? How can we address the challenge of Christian nationalism in America today? And how can we do so in a manner that is also for, rather than merely against, the people we meet in our classrooms and our churches? Well, fortunately for us, Karl Barth faced similar questions as he pursued his theological work at the University of Bonn in 1933. That year turned out to be among the most significant in Barth's life, in part because of the lessons he learned while facing the challenge of Christian nationalism. Bart knew the dismay that comes with seeing Christian symbols co-opted by politicians. He knew the sting of betrayal and the pain of broken relationships. He knew the anxiety of watching a church you love embrace idolatry. 91 years later, Bart's decisions, statements, and actions have much to teach us as we consider the challenge of Christian nationalism today. Let's tell his story, part two. We begin on January 3rd, 1933, with a letter written that day to Bart's close friend, Edward Turnheisen, by Charlotte von Kirschbaum. She writes, Carl is currently experiencing difficult days as he's thinking about his theological friends. These friends were Emil Brunner and Friedrich Gogarten both of whom were associated with the dialectical theology movement that Bart had helped start over a decade before. Bart's relation to them had been growing increasingly strained and matters were near a breaking point. Bart's Church Dogmatics, the first volume, had appeared in print just two months earlier and Bart had used the preface to distance himself from the dialectical theology movement. Bruner received his copy in late November and on December 13th, he wrote a letter to thank Bart. He said Bart's new book was a cathedral of impressive proportions, but he also noted that he and Bart were moving in opposite directions methodologically. While Bart was looking backward to the theological tradition, Bruner said he was looking forward toward a dogmatics that seeds his service in answering the questions that people today are asking. This description deeply aggravated Bart. In a letter to Turnheisen, he complained that Brunner gave him, quote, an honorary salute only then to come back all the more unteachably with the same ideas that Bart had been rejecting since his Roma break. Bart's relationship with Gogarden was even more strained. Their affiliation began in 1922 when Gogarden, Bart, and Turnheisen became the founding editors of Zwischen den Zeiten, the journal which served as the primary outlet for the dialectical theologians. But careful readers noticed a rift opening between Gogarten and Bart as the years progressed. Their differences came into full view with Gogarten's 1929 review of Bart's Christica Dogmatic, his first published volume of Dogmatics delivered originally in Munster. In that review, Gogarten criticized Bart for downplaying the role of human natural capacities in the event of divine revelation. He insisted that Christ incarnation means that theologians can begin with the human recipient of divine revelation and then speak of God. 
Bart responded to Gogarten in a five-page, small print section of Church Dogmatics 1-1, where he calls his suggestions, Gogarten's suggestions, a fresh betrayal in the pattern of the older liberal theology. He argues that any knowledge of God's relation with humanity available through God's act of creation has been lost through the fall. And this knowledge is restored only in the gospel, in special revelation. A theologian who begins by reflecting on created human capacities thus can only mislead. Bart concludes that there must not even be the appearance of an anthropology serving as the basis of the understanding of God's word. Although published in 1932, Bart sent the draft of his response to Gogarten to Gogarten in 1931, and he asked him for feedback. Gogarten had never replied. Now, in the opening days of 1933, according to Charlotte, Bart was preoccupied by the arguments in Gogarten's new book on political ethics. He was particularly disturbed by Gogarten's use of the word creation as a cover to ground his dogmatic claims in philosophy and natural theology. Bart's anxieties reached a boiling point on the evening of January 2nd. Ernst Fuchs, who at that time was a young minister and aspiring professor, visited Bart at home and pleaded with him personally to publicly break ties with Bruner and Gogart, because he said failing to do so would be dangerous given the current situation. Events were in fact chaotic in both the church and the state. In the Prussian church elections of mid-November, the Deutsche Christians had won a third of the seats. Shortly, shortly after the church election, German Reich Chancellor Franz von Papen resigned, in part due to his inability to restrain the growing street violence between Nazis and communists. After two weeks of uncertainty, Minister of Defense General Kurt von Schleicher reluctantly accepted the position of Reich Chancellor on December 3rd. Schleicher struggled during his first weeks in office because he lacked the authority to restrain the parties in conflict. And meanwhile, the Nazis were calling for a Hitler chancellorship, saying that only he could fix Germany's problems. The morning after Fuchs' visit, the same day von Kirschbaum is writing her letter to Turnheisen, Bart writes to Gogarten and asks for a meeting on January 6th to talk through their disagreements. Gogarten quickly responded with a postcard claiming that he did not have time to meet. From this moment on, Bart spoke openly about ending Zeit. On January 10th, Bart wrote Bruner, and he said that their difference was not about method, but about substance. The prior year had been painful, Bart said, but many things were now clear between them. Clearest of all was the fact that the dialectical theology movement had always been a, quote, fictitious alliance. Words of Bart's concerns traveled fast. On January 17th, Georg Mertz, who served as the managing editor of Swishington Zeitung, wrote Bart to mediate the situation and try to save the journal. Bart replied that he wanted to be free from this tiresome and unpleasant matter. He worried that anyone who saw his name next to Gogartens on the journal would be misled, and he suggested that he either resign as editor or that the journal end publication altogether. On January 24th, Mers informed Bart that he had removed the editor's names from the title page of the latest issue to avoid confusion. And for the time being, Bart accepted this compromise. On January 28th, just a few days later, Reich Chancellor Schleier, Schleicher resigned. After two days of intense negotiations, Adolf Hitler was sworn in as the new Reich Chancellor of Germany. As we heard earlier, Bart was sick in bed that day, and he later recalled that it was there that he realized that the German people were beginning to worship a false god. The next day, Bart met with his publisher, Albert Lemp, and told him that he wanted to end Zwischendenzeit. But for now, the journal continued. Part three. On February 4, in the name of national security in advance of the March 5th German parli parliamentary elections, Reich Chancellor Hitler placed temporary constraints on the press and political gatherings. In the weeks that followed, Hitler depicted the election as a decisive turning point in the battle against Marxism. On February 27th, less than a week before election day, the German Reichstag building was burned down. Hitler blamed the communists, 
And the next day, he acquired emergency powers to imprison anyone suspected of undermining the government. On election day, partly due to these measures, the National Socialists won a coalition majority. With new power, Hitler immediately banned the Communist Party from operating in Germany. By March 20th, the first concentration camp opened in Dachau for communists and other political resistors. With the passage of the Enabling Act on March 23rd, Hitler effectively became dictator of Germany. Throughout these historic weeks, Hitler displayed a keen awareness that his power in Germany would be limited without the support of Catholic and Protestant church leaders. He regularly called both churches to assist the government in the, quote, moral elevation of the German people. As these events were unfolding, Bart traveled to Denmark to deliver a lecture entitled The First Commandment as the Axiom of Theology. He used this lecture to criticize those he believed were intentionally or accidentally laying the theological groundwork for the capitulation of the German church to Hitler. He explains that those who know the God of Sinai do not speak of a timeless relation between humanity and God, but of a history which occurs in time. The God who speaks at Sinai is none other, Bart says, than the God of the gospel. This God, oh, he, I just said that sentence, next sentence. Revelation takes place, he says, in reconciliation, in the covenant between God and humanity, which is established and kept by God. It takes place through forgiveness of sins, justification and sanctification, even as the revelation of the law. Jesus Christ is the meaning of the law of Sinai inasmuch as he is the revelation of God. Bart argues that the reformers operated with this Christ-centered method by measuring every external source of knowledge by the criterion of Christ as attested in scripture. Even those reformers who engaged in natural theology, Bart says, did not allow nature, history, or reason to judge divine revelation. Instead, they judged these realities in light of Christ. The problem is that many Protestant theologians, and here Bart mentions Bruner and Gogarten by name, place God's revelation in Christ alongside reason, history, culture, creation, humanity, or the state. It is not surprising, Bart says, that these theologians always, quote, speak the loudest and most urgently and the most solemnly whenever they speak of those things which have been brought into relation with revelation by means of that little word, and, end quote. The inevitable result, he says, is Christ's subordination. Bart writes, whenever theology has seriously operated with the arbitrary concept of a revelation derived from creation by means of some more or less intelligent exegesis of our existence, the consequence has always been that the revelation of which the first commandment speaks has been reduced to something subordinate, a mere shadow. The way forward is for Protestant theology to take its leave of each and every natural theology and dare in that, that narrow isolation to cling solely to the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Now Bart drew firm lines in this lecture, but because his words were delivered in another country and not yet in print, they made little impact on the German situation. On March 28th, German Catholic bishops who had previously objected to National Socialism were forced by the Catholic Church to issue a statement withdrawing their objections. A concordat between Rome and the Third Reich was on the way. Meanwhile, Hitler grew frustrated with the organizational complexity of the Protestant Church in Germany, which was divided by region, confession, and governance. Hitler wanted a unified Reich Church under a single Reich bishop with whom he could work. Nazi officials began urging Protestant leaders to implement structural reforms in the Protestant church, and they found these leaders willing to listen. Since both Hitler and Joseph Goebbels were Roman Catholic, many Protestants were anxious about losing influence with the government. In April, Bart traveled to his beloved Berkeley in the mountains near Lake Zurich for a little vacation, but he could not hide from the crisis. Georg Mertz wrote Bart that if he was going to get involved in the church situation, he needed to confess the German fate and not stand against the changes taking place. Bart replied brusquely that he would do the exact opposite. Meanwhile, events in Germany continued to develop. 
Hitler appointed German Christian partisan Ludwig Mueller as his representative for church affairs. And he instructed him to work toward a unified Protestant church. Church leaders created a new committee to work with Mueller on a revised church constitution. In their initial statement, the committee said, a powerful nationalist movement has seized and uplifted our German people. To this turning point in history, we say a grateful yes. We recognize in the event of our day, a new commission given by our Lord to his church. Bart returned from Bergley to Bonn, determined to do something, but he spent the first weeks of May navigating a changing university. Every administrator who refused to publicly support the new government was removed from his position, which led to a reshuffling of responsibilities. Bart unexpectedly had to take on an especially heavy teaching load. When the semester began, student groups organized rallies for the Nazi regime and urged boycotts of the lectures of Bart and other suspect faculty. On the evening of May 10th, a book burning took place in the Bonn Marktplatz, led by several university professors. Bart did not restrain his speech in the classroom, but he did choose his words carefully. Instead of confronting the German Christians directly, he focused on the subject matter of theology and sought to undermine their theological presuppositions. Yet the church situation was becoming complicated by the formation of a new mediating party, the Young Reformation Movement, consisting mostly of Lutheran pastors. They supported the Nazi party and its proposed reforms, but they sought a clearer operational distinction between the church and the state than the German Christians were seeking. On May 18th, Friedrich Gogarten publicly aligned with this mediating movement. He argued in a sermon that the church could not stand idle in the midst of this great renewal that God was bringing, God was bringing to the German people through the new government. While maintaining its independence from the government, the church needed to link arms with its new political leadership and participate in the divine movement. In his writings from then on, Gogarten began to cite the argument of arguments of German Christian theologian Wilhelm Staple, who had declared in his book, The Christian State, Statesman, that the law of God should be seen as one and the same as the law of the German people. That same week, the newly formed church committee issued its initial proposal for a unified Reich church consisting of different confessions overseen by a national synod and a single Reich bishop. The German Christians and Hitler himself wanted Ludwig Mueller to be the new bishop, but instead the committee recommended the Young Reformation Movement's preferred candidate, Pastor Friedrich von Bodelschwing. The committee summoned the various leaders of the Landeskirchen to a meeting on May 26 to adopt the proposed constitution and elect the new bishop. Despite vocal German Christian opposition at the meeting, as we heard this morning, the measure was approved. But the German Christians flatly refused to accept the legitimacy of this election or Bodelschwing's appointment, creating a deep public rift in the church. As controversy rose in the days that followed, Mueller appeal, appealed directly to Hitler for help. And Hitler quickly announced that due to the controversy, he would not receive the newly elected bishop. This sent the church into a deep crisis. The governing bodies of the Lutheran and Reformed churches were called to a meeting on June 23rd and 24th to settle the matter. And these were days full of high drama. In the end, the result was the resignation of Bodelschwink as Reich Bishop and the appointment of German Christian partisan August Jager to a newly created office, the State Commissioner of the Prussian Churches. This unanticipated result provoked chaos throughout Germany in the churches among the pastors. Oh, there they were. Part four. In the days before this pivotal church meeting on June 23rd and 24, a series of friends visited Bart to urge him to make a public statement. Bart hesitated because he was worried that because he was Swiss, his words would make little difference and perhaps even hurt the cause. But he finally decided to write an essay addressing the theological issues at stake. He composed it over the weekend of June 24th and 25th, revising it along the way as he heard the news from the convention and of Yager's appointment. 
since he had been criticized by Bruner for focusing too much on the theology of the past, Bart gave it the title Theological Existence Today with an exclamation point. <laughs> he begins by noting that Protestant leaders have been urged to consider national interests as part of their ministerial vocation, but this is a mistake. Their calling and vocation, he says, is to proclaim Jesus Christ, who is found each day afresh and anew in the holy scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Any church leader seeking reform should begin from this particular starting point. But the German Christians, he says, have not followed this method. They began from the presupposition that the church should support the German government. And so their goal has been to install a leader who has the trust of Adolf Hitler and operates in his image. Quote, what I have to say to this is simple. I say unconditionally and without reservation, no, to the spirit and the letter, and letter of this doctrine. If such teaching were to hold sway in the Protestant church, as is the desire of the German Christians, it would be the end of the Protestant church. End quote. Even so, Barnt says that he will not waste time arguing with the German Christians. As he puts it, when dealing with a movement that can sing a mighty fortress is our God to the accompany, accompaniment of military drums, it is not prudent to get into an argument with it, but rather to give it, or at least its leaders, a wide berth and to speak to other audiences. So he turns then to the Young Reformation movement with which Gogarden associated. Bart argues that while they present themselves as a real alternative to the German Christians, in reality, they agree with the German Christians about the church's role in society, and they are captive to the same politicized theology. My belief, Bart writes, is that after not too long a time, the church will have finished with the public savage heretics. But who will have saved her from the sweet-talking voices of those who seem to be correct as to the standards of church, Bible, and Reformation, and who yet, in principle, do not think differently from the heretics? While the leaders of the Young Reformation movement are right that the church needs to maintain its freedom, they misunderstand the nature of this freedom. The freedom that must be protected, Bart writes, is the freedom of the word of God in preaching and theology. They should not be worrying about the church's operational independence or the procedural tactics of the German Christians, but about whether God will take the lampstand of the gospel away from the church in Germany altogether. The church in Germany will not survive because certain parties win or lose elections, but because its leaders remain obedient to their true calling. Bart writes, what we need more than anything today is surely a spiritual center of resistance that would give sense and substance to a corresponding church political center. Yes, the German church must be for the German people. But, Bart says, we must be for them as who we are and we must do what we have been called to do. And what we are called to do is serve the word of God in the midst of this people." End quote. Bart's publisher, Albert Limp, rushed Bart's manuscript into print so that it appeared just a week later, on July 1st, as a special supplement of Zwischenden Zeit. The pamphlet sold 12,000 copies within two weeks. Emil Brunner wrote Bart an admiring letter, thanking him for his prophetic stance. It is a word on the situation that only you could have written, he said. Bart sent a copy directly to Hitler with a note saying that the Protestant church in Germany should be free to focus on its own task. He did not hear back from Hitler, <laughs> nor did he hear from Friedrich Gogarten. But through friends, he heard that Gogarten was saying that Bart had committed theological suicide by publishing his essay. On the same day that Bart's essay went into print, the draft of the Concordat between the Roman Catholic Church and the Third Reich was finalized and sent to Hitler for ratification. But Hitler wanted to approve it together with a new Protestant agreement, and so he urged Ludwig Mueller to complete the reform process that had started. Over the next two weeks, Mueller wrangled the final form of a new church constitution out of the original committee and called Protestant leaders to Berlin to vote on the proposal. He urged them to move quickly so that the Catholics who already had their agreement with Hitler in hand did not gain a political advantage. On July 11th, church leaders approved a new constitution unanimously, and Hitler signed it on July 14th along with the Roman Catholic Concordat. Later that day, 
With the agreement now signed, Hitler surprised Protestant leaders by ordering a new round of church elections on July 23rd, just nine days later. He then ordered Nazi propaganda offices to help German Christian candidates secure a decisive victory in the election. The fix was in. Given the inevitability of the results, most areas in Germany featured only German Christian nominees on the ballot. But the Young Reformation movement was able to organize an alternative slate of candidates in several cities, including Bonn. And there they were joined by a third slate of candidates from a newly launched group called the For the Freedom of the Gospel Party. Its list of candidates included the name Karl Barth. Since he believed that the other two parties represented no real choice at all, he felt obligated to offer one. On election eve, Hitler commandeered every radio station in Germany to deliver a speech about the church's role in Germany. You can actually find this online and listen to it. He argued that while the Protestant church would always remain free, it should use its freedom for standing up for the freedom of the nation. That same evening, Bart delivered a speech to a thousand people in Bonn. Here's a flyer from that speech. He told the crowd that we cannot discover that God is for us and with us in nature or in history or in the treasure of our life experiences. This gospel becomes known only through the free act of God himself, the word spoken to us in Jesus Christ, of whom the scriptures bear witness. On the basis of this criterion, Bart argues that there was little difference between the two other parties in the election because the young Reformation movement merely says, quote, secretly, mutedly, and restrainedly, what the German Christians say openly, loudly, and consistently. The next day, the German Christian candidates won three quarters of the vote throughout Germany. In the Bonn precinct, the candidates for the, for the Freedom of the Gospel Party garnered 10% of the vote. Part five. The next issue of Zwischen den Zeiten appeared in August. It featured Barth's lecture on the First Commandment, which was printed alongside a review by Heinrich Nittermeyer, who had recently joined the German Christians. It also contained an editorial by Georg Mertz assessing Barth's theological existence today. Mertz had supported the Young Reformation movement during the recent elections, and he maintained this mediating posture in his editorial. He writes that while he agrees with Barth's theological arguments, he sympathizes with many of the practical questions being raised by Barth's critics. He also thinks that Barth's criticisms of the theologians associated with the Young Reformation movement are unfair because their motivations certainly are not what Barth suspects. Barth later called this essay, quote, the classic document of the decision for no decision. But Friedrich Gogarten had no problem making a decision as he demonstrated in mid-August when he joined the German Christian movement. He offered his rationale in a letter to Georg Mertz a few weeks later. He explains that theologians must do more than simply offer negative judgments about the current situation. They also have to present a positive vision for the church's relationship to the state in its current form. That is the reason for my declaration that I have joined the German Christians, he writes. For that is the historical place where what is going to happen in our churches will be decided the decisive theological debates will take place there. When Barth learned of Gogarten's conversion, he demanded a decisive conversation about the future of Zwischenton Zeit. Publisher Albert Lemp arranged a meeting for the editors on September 30th, but only Lemp, Barth, Turnheisen, and Mertz attended. Gogarten sent a letter. He wrote that he was extraordinarily shocked about the possibility of ending the journal because the German church needed it more than ever. We definitely cannot be silent now, he insisted. Bart disagreed, and he proposed that Gogarten be removed as editor and the journal adopt a new structure. But Merz rejected Bart's proposal in part because he thought a compromise was still possible. It was at this point that Bart and Turnheisen decided to break ties with the journal. They announced that their future writings would now be published in a new journal named Theological Existence Today after Bart's essay. As a concession to Merz, they each agreed to write a final essay explaining their decision. Merz also asked them not to depict their new journal as a permanent alternative because he hoped that Bart and Turnheisen could return to Zwischenton Zeiten after the controversy died down. Bart composed his essay two weeks later 
titling it simply Farewell. You can find the first English translation of this essay in um, my collection, uh, The Essential Car Bart, translated by Matthew Bruce, a lovely translation, along with a couple other original pieces never before translated. He writes in the essay that Swish and Zeiten was the result of a productive misunderstanding among those who had identified with the dialectical theology movement. While they initially thought they were allies, recent events made it clear that they were not. He explains that Emil Brunner's recent publications mark a, quote, grievous return to the neo-Protestant or Catholic schema of reason and revelation that they had once together rejected. But at least Brunner opposes the heresy of the German Christians. Gogarten's re recent writings and his endorsement of Wilhelm Staple's political theology filled me with a grief that could no longer be suppressed, Bart says. I regard Staple's dictum about the law of God as the complete betrayal of the gospel. The trajectory of Gogarten's theology meant that Bart was not surprised by the news of Gogarten's decision to join the German Christians. Quote, I acknowledge without further qualification that Gogarten's entire path has led him with the highest degree of consistency to condone everything. The fact that Georg Mertz cannot recognize the serious nature of this disagreement proves that there is a misunderstanding, Bart says. He expresses astonishment that Mertz and so many readers believe they can leisurely listen to me with one ear and go garden with the other. But doing so is impossible, Bart says. Misunderstandings exist in order to be eliminated. Zwischenden Zeiten will no longer be a misunderstanding after I have withdrawn from it. Bart insists that his decision does not mean that his theology has changed. I have always aimed straight at what we at the time, at the beginning of the 20s, appeared to fight together, which is now the agenda in the concentrated form, in the doctrine, in the mentality, in the attitude of the German Christians. Nor was Bart's decision the result of a political disagreement or the fact that Bart is Swiss. I could not better prove my love for Germany, Bart writes, my belonging to it, than by the fact that I am in the thick of things in Germany, contrary to many Germans. No, the reason for Bart's break, he says, is strictly theological. I think our journal could have been a truly ecclesiastical force in modern times if only it had proven itself to be a humble but unbreakable dam against the German Christian flood. In the absence of this commitment, Bart calls those who agree with him on theological matters to abandon their neutrality and to make a final decision. Bart sent his draft to Merz on November 1, with Turnheisen's essay following close behind. After reading both pieces, Merz realized that there was no way forward for the journal. On November 9, he announced that the next issue of Zwischenden Zeiten, this one, would be its last. Part six. The intervening weeks between writing his essay and publishing the journal were busy for Bart. On October 27, Professors in Bonn were instructed to begin and end each class with Heil Hitler, and Bart refused, prompting several meetings with administrators. He traveled to Berlin on October 30th to meet to speak to Martin Niemöller's Emergency Alliance of Pastors. Bart lectured to them on the topic of reformation as decision, arguing that the reformation stemmed from the reformers' rejection of the conjunction of the gospel with Catholic culture. German... Uh, German Protestants, he said, today face a similar decision. A person must now say yes or no, want this or that, stand here or there. Bart spent Reformation Day the next day with multiple groups of German pastors. He emphasized the importance of the first commandment and their need to make a decision about their true calling. When a pastor asked whether he should stay in the church or resign his pulpit, Bart said pastors should remain in their positions as long as they realize that to collaborate now means to protest. On November 13, German Christian leader Reinhold Krosse delivered a widely publicized speech to an audience of 20,000 people in the Sports Palace in Berlin. To sustained ovations, he called for a second German Reformation in the tradition of Martin Luther. The crescendo came with Cross's call to eliminate Jewish influence throughout the German church. Quote, the Jews are certainly not God's people. 
If we national socialists are ashamed to buy a necktie from a Jew, then we should really be ashamed to accept from a Jew anything that speaks to our soul. People of Jewish blood did not belong in the German people's church. This rejection of all things Jewish extended to the Old Testament itself. Because pastors, he said, cannot appeal to the Old Testament and also proclaim a Christianity for the German people. For all practical purposes, he wrote or said, the one excludes the other. Cross's speech sparked intense controversy throughout Germany, prompting many German Christians to end their affiliation with the movement. This included Friedrich Gogarten, whose association had lasted a total of four months. In the wake of the ensuing scandal, Bart saw an opportunity and again traveled to Berlin to meet with disaffected pastors. But he left this meeting disappointed that they were far more concerned with ecclesiastical politics than with the theological issues at stake. On December 10th, Bart had the opportunity to deliver a speech of his own, a sermon, an Advent sermon for the University of Bonn. He selected as his text Romans 15, 5 through 13, and he focused on verse 7, welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you. Bart says that the central message of Christmas is that Jesus Christ has welcomed us into God's life. In Christ, God adopts us, includes us, and takes us in. But the incarnation gives us something else special to consider, Bart says. The fact that Jesus Christ was a Jew. That people's blood was, in his veins, the blood of the Son of God. That people's character he accepted by taking on human beings. Bart says that Christ's Jewish flesh reminds us that there are those who are not Jews by nature, who are outsiders to the promises of God. But in God's mercy, he allows Gentiles to be included alongside Jews in the salvation Christ brings to Israel. Salvation comes from the Jews, Bart says. And through this salvation, Christ binds humans together in a way that no friendship, no common convictions, or community, or state can hold human beings together. During Bart's sermon, several audience members walked out in protest. Part seven. And finally, the story of how Karl Barth faced the challenges of 1933 has several lessons, I think, to teach us about our current situation and how we can consider the challenge posed by Christian nationalism in America today. For time's sake, I'm gonna mention four of these lessons and then I look forward to a discussion. First, Bart teaches us that opposition to Christian nationalism begins with a decision about the nature of our calling. Bart navigates the complexities of 1933 by repeatedly drawing lines and demanding a decision about them. He rejects every attempt at mediation. When Emil Brunner writes Bart kind letters and says that they are allies who simply disagree about method, Bart draws a line and says, no. When the Young Reformation movement justifies its cooperation with the government by insisting that the church can still remain distinct from the state, Bart draws a line and says no. When Merz and Gogarten want Zeiten to continue as a forum where their disagreements can be debated for the sake of Germany, Bart draws a line and says no. Bart was willing to break friendships, end his journal, lose his job, and damage his reputation to make his opposition to Christian nationalism clear. As he says in Farewell, this rigidness does not stem from stubbornness, despite what people think, but from his prior decision about the nature of his calling as a theologian. There is a reason why the first article of the Barman Declaration that we discussed this morning comes first. Jesus Christ, as he is attested to us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Bart would say that this statement draws the line about which we must decide now, and then again every day, if we are to make the same decision about Christian nationalism when the crucial moment comes. Second, Bart teaches us that the problem of Christian nationalism will not be solved through the acquisition of power. Throughout 1933, Bart expressed frustration with church leaders who focused on political maneuvering our church processes. By trying to beat the German Christians at their own game, these leaders simply reinforced the theological presuppositions that made the German Christians possible. 
Christian nationalism, in his mind, will not be overcome by trying to win elections. This merely masks, prolongs, and strengthens its existence. Bart today would tell us, I think, that worrying about the news cycle, responding to the latest outrage, or arguing with, convin with the convinced is a distraction from our most important work. We must be focused on the deeper theological issues at stake. And this leads us to the third lesson. Bart teaches us that Christian nationalism stems from a possessive theological logic. Many in Bart's time were confused when Bart said that Brunner, Gogarten, and the German Christians were all committing the same error he had been rejecting ever since his break from liberalism. The key to understanding Bart's claim is to grasp the precise problem he is identifying. As he sees it, Protestant liberalism, natural theology, and Christian nationalism all depict God's knowledge of God in possessive terms, as something present and available to humans that can be discerned through a process of self-understanding, self-realization, and accumulation. Bart worried that this approach inevitably allows the knowledge of God to be connected directly to one's culture, people, and nation. The central insight of Bart's Romer brief is that knowledge of God can never be a possession, something humans attain, control, and then deploy. No, for Bart, God's otherness means that God can only be known through God in the midst of an ongoing relationship with God, one in which our self-knowledge is interrupted, broken, and reformed by God again and again. Knowledge of God involves obedience rather than possession. In this light, Bart would tell us to look for possessive logics within American Christian nationalism. And in this case, one need look no further than the biblicism that runs through much of American evangelicalism, where common sense hermeneutics and democratic perspicuity mean that anyone can know God and apply the truths of the Bible without consulting church tradition or pretty much anyone at all. Bart would urge us to help our students and congregations recognize that owning a Bible does not mean possessing God's word, and that the Bible is not a handbook for life in this world but an invitation to enter a strange new one. Fourth and final, Bart teaches us by what he failed to do in 1933. Bart later expressed regret that he did not do more for the Jew Jewish people during this crisis. While no one could have predicted everything, I think Bart's failure to do more reflects the unfinished nature of his theology during this period and beyond. Throughout 1933, Bart's solution to Christian nationalism was largely methodological. We should begin with Jesus Christ as attested in scripture and be obedient to what we hear. This solution is partial and abstract, in part because it neglects to spell out in concrete terms a corresponding way of life. But as Bart's Advent sermon reveals, the biblical text, and Paul in particular, is showing him the way forward even if he did not yet fully see it. The deep story of Christian nationalism will be overcome only as we learn to live together as a people whose communal life is shaped by the even deeper story of Christ's divine welcome to humanity and the corresponding mutual welcome of Jew and Gentile in Christ. While Bart began to work out the implications of this way of life in the later volumes of the Church Dogmatics, it has been Bart's readers who have done so more directly. And leading the way have been those readers of Bart working from within the tradition of the black church, which has borne the brunt of centuries of white Christian nationalism. We find Bart's Christological trajectory clarified in the early work of James Cone, who sees the particularity of the Jewish flesh of Jesus as a revelation of God's identification with the oppressed and the Christian calling to struggle for freedom. We also see it more recently in the work of Willie James Jennings, who extends Bart's thoughts to show that cultural continuity should be measured by our desire to belong to others, and that the way of Christ involves a willingness to be transformed by the languages, landscapes, and logics of the people around us. These later readings reveal that Bart's core insights have yet to be fully worked out, just as the true nature of human being has yet to be fully worked out. They teach us that resistance against Christian nationalism begins with fighting on behalf of those most harmed by it. 
that life with God is more about surrendering than defending our freedom, and that we will become what we always have been destined to be only as we walk the way of Jesus and love across difference. Thank you for your attention. conversation. We are going to try to wrap up at 10 till the hour. Um, feel free to raise your question. Please say your name uh, before you ask your question and wait for the microphone to come to you. Thank you, Keith, for your paper. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas Alexander from uh, Virginia Seminary in Alexandria. Um, there are so many resonances between what we just heard and what Dr. Gallagher Gallagher uh, presented just moments ago. And something that um, I've been thinking about since um, your last few points and thinking about the way in which Dr. Gallagher described um, confessions as setting limits or articulating the limits that, that ought to exist. But in the way that you've described here, Bart's um, rejection of this possessive theological logic that, that we can't master that which is supposed to master us, it seems that limits have no place um, in our thinking through scripture. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that. What, what roles do limits play for Bart? Yeah, really good question. You know, paragraph 27, I think it is, is the limits of the knowledge of God. Um, as Bart thinks, and I, I'm thinking of Kate's paper on Sunday night about how Bart recovered as he saw himself living into the reform tradition and the reformation tradition, it was about a posture as much as it was about a set of commitments. And that doesn't um, mean that commitments don't serve a, a function or a role in dogmatic theology, but they are not the, um, the boundaries are not where we focus in the sense of the goal is to inscribe and then perhaps have and possess a claim that you then hold because that, runs against this constant reformation that has to be happening as you encounter a God you cannot master and cannot possess every day. So as you're articulating a limit one day, having a confession, which you thought was important, um, you're also re-examining it every day. So it cannot become your focus. Um, and there's a posture embedded in that. That's, I think Bart is attuned to um, at a deep level as he thinks about theology in general, as Kate brought out beautifully on Sunday, but particularly as he thinks about this crisis, he sees um, a, a lack of that posture. There's an, a, a sense among the German Christians, especially of owning God and claiming God. And he saw that same trait in so many others who had different views, but, but had that singular trait. And I think that's the, the trait when he's saying, I'm, I'm just fighting the same battle again and again and again. It's that trait, I think, that he has in mind. And if a confession was used in that possessive form, he would be against it. If a confession was used and, and a limit saying this is this is where we can go and no further was not used in that possessive form, then I think it would be for it. So it would depend on its use. Really good question. Uh, thank you, Keith. Your narration of the developments of 1933 was both lucid and chilling. But I want to ask about your final four points, and in particular the third. Would I be understanding you correctly by saying that the evangelical, the characteristic evangelical way of appropriating scripture bears its logical fruit in Christian nationalism in the U.S. The characteristic way on the ground that is often functioning, I think, objectively leads to that, as we are seeing. That is not the best teaching of the doctrines um, of that are that have animated evangelicalism or the evangelical tradition, but it is the form of biblicism post World War II. Um, there's a whole story we could start telling about the shrinking of the evangelical imagination post-World War II 
with great heroes like Billy Graham who become mass marketers and what becomes what had been a story of Christ becomes a message packaged in facts and tracks and um, propositions. And there's a reading of the Bible that gets inserted and played along with that. And that once you have a consumeristic gospel, transactional, mass marketed, reduced to fractional um, tidbits and verses, um, with a lot of other factors feeding into this, you get a, um, a use of the Bible like you use any other product. Um, that is not what is taught by the, by the classic evangelical theologians, but it is what happens in the pews. And I think the inevitable result is possessing God or thinking that you do. And when you put those people in the context of this particular moment in America, they're gonna come out Christian nationalist, at least in the, in, with the current dynamics. So the force of resistance, what you heard me is saying, in some sense, the big theological challenge, I think if Bart were in this moment, in my seat, he would, he would have a different aim. He would say, we have to unleash scripture from the possession of the people so that they are possessed by it, so that they reread it. And that's a, that's a lifetime task, um, which I see every day in the classroom. And a losing battle at the moment, but not forever. Uh, David Somore, uh, Westminster Seminary, former undergraduate student of yours. Um, I was thinking of the, the last section of the four um, lessons we can learn. And looking at Bart in other moments after 1933, looking at him when in the heat of the war, um, for example, when his his essay, the defense of the defense and weapons of a Christian, that uh, Christine or Dr. Teets points out in the critical biography, where Barr will go on to say, and I quote: "Every Czech soldier who then fights and suffers will also be doing it for Jesus Christ." How? When is? How do we see that Bart's met methodology work out? When, when is the call for God's fresh word to be something so drastic? Or how do we make sense of um, Bart's theology as the geopolitical situations uh, change? And he starts to say things of that nature, if that makes sense. Particularly about taking up arms? He, yeah, fine. yeah, where he yeah. says things of, in those lines. Um, it's an interesting question for Bart and whether it's consistent with his own best impulses to do so. Um, I certainly think he, over time, especially through the 30s, grew in the sense that he needed to be more concrete about the corresponding ethical actions that follow from the claims methodologically that he's making. And he does that. Um, he's doing that from the beginning, but he really realizes, because of the crisis, how concrete he needs to be. He does work it out in some pretty particular ways. He was a, a proponent of the war, but with a, a particular lens. He didn't, you know, he wasn't... Um, unrestrained in the way he talked about it, but he, he thought that the, the war should be fought. Um, and there's an intra-Bardian debate over whether he should have um, or should have taken a more um, nonviolent route. Um, but it's um, for him, as he's working through, he's realizing that he has to apply to particular situations the ethics he's proclaiming. But when you do that, as we all know by living life, it's really complicated and it's hard to make those jumps. That's it's a lot easier to retreat in method. Um, and I think you're seeing as, as you're kind of behind the question, exposing some of those tensions and some of the questions, how do you justify it? I think it's part of that complexity. Um, one that we have to live into at this moment. If you think about, okay, I, I do want to follow Jesus. I do want to do obey what he says. What does that look like if you're a pastor, as I was talking um, this morning, a pastor of a church in Alabama who Christian nationalism is everywhere and you love your people and you want to, you want to confront it, but you also want to be for them, which is your calling. How do those things converge? And Bart, um, throughout the 30s, he's navigating what it looks like for the church to do that. Another great text is Letters to American Christians, where he's trying to tell Americans how to do that. And he's got lots of um, some really interesting insights. And I don't know if he actually works it out. Um, some of his heirs do, though, in different ways. And that's an interesting conversation as we think of where Cohn would take it. He'd have a very definite answer. Um, and of course, he's not a Bardian, but he's spinning off on this on some points. And some others would have very different readings. And you could put Bonhoeffer in the mix for a really interesting conversation. 
I think we're going to take one online question um, and then wrap up. The question is, the word of God is not known through possession, but he is known through obedience. How do we translate for the church this form of theologicalist epistemology and convey its significance for discipleships? From David Choi. Yeah, translating it for the church, um, this idea that theology is an act of obedience. So when you think of, I'm in a room full of theological teachers, so and I'm thinking of Kevin's, the end of Kevin's lecture last night, um, or yesterday afternoon, of um, inherent to the task of teaching theology is a willingness to welcome others, to be hospitable and generous, to be changed by others as you encounter them, to sense God at work in unexpected places, in the sense that for a theologian teaching theology, especially I think in this context, we don't just draw from the same voices or the same even methods, that the front lines of theology is generally not the classroom, but the pulpit and um, life lived on the ground, and that you are, as a th theological teacher, drawing from these insights with humility, because it always knocks you off your feet. It's a lot easier to come back into our scholarship. I think of, when I look at the library here at PTS where I spent many, many long hours, I think that was my happy place because I can control it, I'm comfortable. When I'm in front of my students and they're asking me the hardest questions in the history of theology every day, um, stump the professor, and they're doing so often asking, and how do I apply this to, to what's going on right now? And I have no idea what to say. I need help for that and it's humbling and there's a sense of I have to the only way you can do that is to have a form of ongoing listening that looks more like obedience than possession and so the virtues that go along with this kind of theological life are an openness to learning from multiple voices from different disciplines drawing in different insights being formed by that constant challenge to your um, the pride that comes with knowing things and coming in saying, I am also in this classroom a learner, drawing in, and we are lifelong learners as we engage this, this discipline together. Um, it would look something like that. And you could, as a, you can embody that as a pastoral leader in a church, as you're thinking as a pastor, what does it look like to, um, to teach my people over time, but embody a posture of obedience and learning and humility as I do it? Um, I think a long, um, career as a pastor doing that, the posture would matter far more than any lesson you taught um, in making a difference. And it may begin there. The, as we think about Christian nationalism, and particularly in the environment of people who possess God, um, showing that you can follow God without owning him may be a, and you can follow God by learning from people who are very different, is a starting point. Keith, thank you again for that really fine paper. We're dismissed. Enjoy your lunch.